Okay, uh, we are going to begin. Just to make sure you're in the right place, um, this is, uh, today is Wednesday, April 12th. It's 3 p.m. I know that because I looked at my, my phone. And this panel is number 3712, entitled The Pursuit of Happiness. I'm Ralph Gregory. I'm chairman of Intelligent Office, a company that was born in Boulder 21 years ago. And we now have 66 locations throughout North America. And we are a proud sponsor of the Conference on World Affairs. I also host a half an hour talk show on local TV on uh, Boulder Channel 8 called Deliberate Conversations. And in that show, uh, in half an hour, we explore a single topic uh, with two knowledgeable guests. And uh, you can imagine how target rich the Conference on World Affairs is for that show. I, I did two earlier today, I got three tomorrow. Uh, a, a lot of really interesting, capable people. You can find Deliberate Conversations because I know you're gonna wanna look it up. You just Google Deliberate Conversations Boulder and there's about 80 shows up there and I guarantee you'll find something you like. And uh, it's all designed, uh, we, we cover everything under the sun. Okay, and with that, a word from our sponsor. Good afternoon, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Paul Cure. I'm with the CWA Fundraising Committee. I hope that we're not all fully knowledgeable in regards to all the different topics of conversation that you've had already today and this week. Uh, I just have a quick, quick announcement just in regards to at the end of this session, if you are interested in donating to the CWA, such as Ralph has, as, as so many other people have over there, you can see some of our sponsors over there. Uh, the ushers will have envelopes uh, donation envelopes, as well as on the CWA app that we're all getting used to, there is a button that you can push and it'll give you a list of the sponsors and if you would like to contribute in that way. But most importantly, you're here and that's the most important sponsorship that we have. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, in this session, uh, we're using a note card system for questions. Uh, it's not the app, uh, it's gonna be actual writing. So if you have a question, Raise your hand and one of the volunteers, Joe and another person back there, will come and give you a card and you write your question on the card, it'll come up here and we'll see what we can do with it. Fair enough? Okay, so this is the uh, pursuit of happiness. And um, you know, I, I actually have been looking at this subject for quite a while, long before this panel. And I found that uh, for eons, uh, psychologists were studying what made people sad. And about 15 or 20 years ago, uh, there was a, uh, uh, they started thinking about uh, what made people happy. And there's been a ton of interesting information that's come out about that. So let me introduce our panelists to you today. To my immediate left is Mark Jetve, and that's a Hungarian name. He heads up a Russian company in Moscow. He lives in Moscow. He's not a Russian, but uh, uh, he, uh, he lives and works in Moscow. And he has a distinction of working in the coldest and most polluted city in the world. It's not Moscow. It's uh, Norlisk. And uh, it's the only city where pollution was visible from a satellite. And you're here to tell us you, you survived that. <laughs> Uh, again, to his immediate left is Claire Daly. Uh, she is a musician, and uh, she's uh, from New York. And it's interesting, we have two musicians on this panel. That'll come out later uh, about why they're here. Or maybe it was accidental, but it's interesting in relationship to this subject. As a red-haired, freckly kid, she did TV commercials in New York. She was a kid actress in uh, uh, commercials for American Express, Volkswagen, and Bell Telephone. To her immediate left is uh, Julie Landsman, uh, another, uh, another musician, uh, and she's also from New York. I don't know what it is about New York where all those musicians are. I guess you go where the action is. And uh, she's in love with her dog, uh, Maya, and she has hundreds of children throughout the world because she's a teacher, and she stays in touch with them, and they go all around. And then our last guest is Tai Tashiro. Now, Tai Tashiro 
uh, is a, uh, he's an author and a social scientist. And I suspect he is the only person on this panel uh, where this subject really uh, relates to his field of endeavor. Uh, CWA is famous for throwing people into subjects that, <laughs> why, why am I here? But uh, I think happiness uh, relates to all of us. Uh, he, even though he's from New York, he has been uh, characterized as, as an eternal optimist. So, Ty, let's start with you. Uh, have you studied happiness? Have you researched this? And if you have, tell us. Yeah, it's just kind of a hot topic right yeah, now in is. psychology. Yeah, so, um, around 1998, 1999, uh, a fellow at University of Pennsylvania, Martin Seligman, raised about $25 million uh, over the course of a couple months uh, after he gave a couple lectures about this idea of positive psychology. So I'll give you just a quick background here. Psychologists have spent most of the past 140 years studying how things go wrong. So we study what happens when you're angry or you're depressed or you're anxious or whatever else. We're really good at that, actually. And we're good at getting you less bad, whatever that might be for you. But we, all, we know almost nothing about how to take you from zero to positive five or positive 10. And oddly enough, just in the past, I guess, 15, 16 years, we started to understand happiness. So I'll tell you a little bit about it, maybe just to lay some groundwork for what we'll talk about today. Um, you know, happiness, it functions. So all mo emotions function. When you feel angry, that's because something's unfair and that motivates you to right the wrong. When you feel fearful, you want to avoid something that might be dangerous. Uh, when you feel happy, that's a really interesting state. Because what would be the evolutionary adaptiveness of feeling happy? And it turns out it's kind of an interesting answer. Um, when you're happy, that means that there's nothing threatening in your environment. Which that sounds kind of weird, but there's, there's nothing for you to worry about. And this liberates your mind to just kind of wander around. And what you find in studies is if you induce happiness in research participants, they're significantly more creative than people who are in a neutral mood state or certainly a negative mood state. So there's a lot of um, uh, thinking right now that positive emotions were helpful for us because they do more than just feel good. They actually help us think in ways that are more complex and more creative, help us uh, be adventurous to try out things we might not try otherwise. Uh, the other big finding I think that's come out and that's been debated right now is what can you do about it? So are you stuck with a certain level of happiness? Happiness shows heritability rates around 55 to 60 percent, which is pretty substantial. Uh, but that still means that about 40 percent is environmental and could be malleable. And the most predominant theory right now is something called the hedonic treadmill, which is a horribly jargony term for you're stuck with your level of happiness that you've been at for your whole life. And it's just kind of a depressing thought sometimes, but <laughs> it, it's, it's not that simple, it turns out. And people can make significant changes in their levels of happiness. And I think this is where the social sciences are at right now. We're trying to figure out what factors influence bumps in happiness or decrements in happiness. And they're having some success with that. Some of the answers actually are not pleasing uh, about what can improve happiness. So for example, if you spend money on things that enhance your physical appearance, this is actually one of the things you can spend money on that will actually improve your happiness across multiple years. Oh. And I think it's, you know, what the, it's a really dumb answer because you just like look in the mirror every day and you're like, gosh, I look good, you know? And that, <laughs> somehow gives you a bump. So um, I, I'm not going to go on and on about all the different correlates and all the different predictors. I, I think it's speculative right now, although there's some answers. Uh, some of it's speculative, and I'd, I'd like to hear what the other panelists have to say about what Well, I want to ask our, our musicians a question, because uh, in the things that I've read about happiness, uh, that um, one of the big elements that leads to happiness is, as Joseph Campbell, that great contemporary philosopher, said, follow your passion. The people who are doing what they love are, that's one of the criteria that makes those folks happy. Now, we assume that musicians, because that is such a difficult business to survive in, and you're surviving, you're musicians, 
you're doing what you love, so therefore, by extrapolation, musicians are happier than the average? Uh, would that be true? I'm not so sure that's so true, mm -hmm. but I am following my passion. I love what I do. Mm -hmm. I love connecting with other musicians while playing. I cultivate happiness. I don't believe I was born happy, although maybe I was and forgot about it. <laughs> but over the years of difficulties, I've learned to cultivate happiness. And one of my cultivating arenas is with my students and how I connect with them and how I mentor them and teach them. And another one is playing beautiful music. I had the privilege of working at the Metropolitan Opera for 25 years. I was the solo French horn, so I was accompanying Luciano Pavarotti on a nightly basis. Ooh. Yeah. Did that make you happy? I have goosebumps just saying it. <laughs> yeah. The next thing will be tears because I, don't, I retired in 2010 and I miss it terribly, but I find other ways. I'm in other groups and I work with my students. I played a concert last night here called Music from the Heart. So it's a cultivated state for me. I make an intention to be happy, and I do love what I do. Claire, you worked with Robert Palmer, oh. uh, 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 Addicted wow. to Love. Uh, you know, uh, yes, I was on uh, the Addicted to Love uh, tour. And, and he, I believe, lived in Jamaica, right? Mm -hmm. Was he a happy guy? Yes, I would say yes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I, I would say about myself, about mm -hmm. being happy, I don't think, I, I don't know that I'm, I know that I'm, I'm re I say reasonably happy in my life because I think anybody who's happy all the time is very scary. <laughs> and, um, but I think that I'm reasonably happy and, I, and I, I do love my life and I love the music. I love, I, I love the people in my life primarily. But I think that I have a capacity to be happy. And I think, I'm not sure, but I think whatever field I chose to be in, I think I would find myself happy in. I don't, I don't know if that makes sense, but I don't think, oh, we're so special because we're musicians, we get to be happy, and the rest of you have to go to work every day. You know, it, it's, I don't think it's like that. I mean, I think people have a capacity to be happy. Um, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know, it's arguable, and I'm all ears. Well, you mentioned uh, uh, one of the uh, things that comes out in all the, the readings that I have is uh, another basic tenet of happiness are people who are, uh, have connectedness with other people. It's in relationships. And, uh, you know, we all have tribes. It might be, you know, I have a tribe at school or a tribe at work or a tribe at my passion or, uh, you know, my hobby or whatever it is. But uh, relationships is, uh, is a big part of that. Um, uh, the, the, you must have a tribe in the musical world, right? I have an enormous tribe. Yes. And, Me and too. I love Me it. Too. Yeah. yeah. I had a company of a thousand people at the Met. It's pretty mm -hmm. overwhelmingly mm -hmm. loving. Has anyone on this panel ever identified an aha moment where you, you said, oh, that's what makes me happy, and, and it became sort of a course correction for you. Can you think of anything that occurred in your life that made you think that? Well, I, I, I can add a little bit to that, it, 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 because I, I look at happiness as sort of a relative word. Excuse me, your mic there. I, I look at happiness as a relative word. You know, in order to understand it, you need to understand an opposite. So to understand right, you need to know to be wrong. To up, you know, up, you need to understand down. And so happiness for, for me in that aha moment was I remember on the 31st of March, 2010, uh, my wife Nadia, who's in the audience, gave birth to our twin daughters. And you know, I knew their names. You know, I knew one name was going to be Lilia, one name was going to be Mira, but I, you know, you didn't know, you didn't, you never saw them. And so when I went in, you know, about 6:45, I got called into the uh, birthing room. I walked in and I saw two swaddled children, and and the nurse, I went to reach to grab one, and the nurse said, "No, you have to take two. And so I, as <laughs> uh, you, know, you have to learn right at this particular point in oh, time. Boy. And so. The thing is when you saw, I had tears in my eyes coming streaming down because now I understood what the opposite was because I, I knew what sadness was because I knew sadness when, when my father died when I was six years old. Mm. And so now I've got the opposite perspective that this was pure blissful happiness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, connectedness, family, relationships. I, uh, 
Uh, my line is that uh, the day you become a parent, God goes in and scrambles your DNA, and there's a whole new sheriff in town from that point forward. Uh, it, those that have children, uh, are your children a source of continuing happiness? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't apply. It does not apply. <laughs> okay. All right. I don't have kids. Anybody down? Well, I, I don't. We might not have much luck with this question, but uh, I, I could give you some data uh, about that. <laughs> uh, th and it points out a, a, an important division between happiness and meaning, and they're two separable concepts actually. And so, what you find with parents is that parents derive a tremendous amount of meaning. Uh, what we call eudaimonic meaning. It's this whole mm -hmm. Socratic term, mm -hmm. right? And that's meaning that comes through struggle <laughs> and sacrifice. And there's a lot of that in parenting, right? Um, but if you look at their hedonic well-being, so just how pleasurable is the average day, there's what you would expect. There's pretty good dips, actually. And if you're <laughs> sleeping, what, three or four hours a night and you know, someone's throwing up on you every day and all these other things, <laughs> it's, it's not a good recipe for happiness. So it's a, it's a divergence, it's a really a convenient divergence to explain this concept of happiness versus, versus meaning and which one people should go for. Well, a lot, a lot too is, is, you know, is happiness the fact of giving something away or is it happiness of receiving? Mm -hmm. and, and I think when you have children, you know, you're almost at the point in your life where you're gonna be give your life away Mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, that's, that's a form of happiness. But, you know, at seven years old, you know, you're still deal dealing with My Little Pony, Shopkins, and all that other stuff that the little, ch little children play with, and we haven't really got to the teenage years. Mm -hmm. So I think in another four or five years, you come back and ask the question, I might have a completely different answer <laughs> on happiness. Well, well in this, uh, this study of connectedness, they, uh, they reference the fact that that starts in your childhood with your parents you know, we have this unconditional love. And I would imagine that if you lost a parent at seven, you know, that has a real impact, uh, you know, not only in your life, but in uh, that whole connectedness thing. Y you know, you, could, uh, you get connectedness also through pets. Uh, and uh, Julie's an example of that. Your pets become your kids. And we've all seen that. Uh, nature, I mean, in Colorado, hello. Uh, I uh, uh, went camping for 25 years uh, out there in wilderness areas, and we used to refer to it as looking for another cathedral. And, and that's, that was the impact. I mean, you know, go out in some of these areas of Colorado, and you just want to uh, know just how insignificant you really are. Uh, go on out there and, and feel nature. So ideas, information, the spiritual world, they're all involved with uh, connectedness. Quite honestly, my pursuit of cultivating happiness comes from deep unhappiness. Really? Having had a rough childhood, having had a separation in, in the last few years, mm -hmm. when you hit bottom, I'm not the type to stay there. I'll fight my way back to the top. I'll find a way, and I'm not a medication kind of gal. So I'll cultivate it through connections with my students, with my family, with my colleagues, with, my, with music with meditation, with energy medicine. I've amassed a huge pool to, to draw upon, to feed my soul, to make me happy, basically. And I do it every day. I swim every day. It makes me very, very happy. That works for me in that I, I kind of feel like um, happiness is a, is a choice. I know it sounds like a cliche, and I'm sorry to say oh, it. it is. But, but I think it's a choice, and I think um, you know, that's why I say, I, for myself, use the expression, you know, I'm reasonably happy. Like, I, my happiness, my internal happiness does not um, rely on the outside circumstances of my life. Like, as things can be going horribly wrong, and they do sometimes. And I can essentially still, at my core, know that I'm okay and that this is something else to get over. Sometimes I can greet it gracefully and sometimes I can't, but that I, that I have a certain level of um, groundedness and knowing that, you know, that my life is pretty good and that I enjoy it and that we're gonna get back to the good stuff. You know, you gotta get through this first. And I, I mean, uh, I heard somebody also say, since I've heard the name of this panel, which was pretty recently, I've been listening to what people talk about or asking people what makes them happy. 
And you know, I think the best thing somebody said was just, I can just decide to be happy right now. I can't be happy yesterday, and I can't be happy tomorrow. I just have to go. Okay, I'm I'm okay. I'm you know I'm here, and and uh, you know f make the best of whatever's happening. The conditions of my life. My happiness doesn't. And of course, there are e examples. You know, I mean, you can't have a horrible outside and be, expect to be happy. But I feel that the um, you know my internal condition doesn't. It can't hinge on the outside events. I think you make a huge point uh, because uh, the research says happiness is intentional. You could choose to be happy. Ty, you picked that up in, in your research? Yeah, I, I think you can certainly choose to be happy. It's, uh, it's a lot of effort, okay. you know, and it's really hard to remember. It's a, it's a commitment. It, it sure is, Every, daily, right? Yeah. It's, it's daily, even hourly, if, if you're going to do this. And so one of the things I think they found in uh, some of these big studies is that the people who significantly change their happiness do that in a habit-formed kind of way. So they don't even have to think about trying to be happy or doing things that make them happy. It's part of their routine. So maybe they uh, meditate or they go swimming or they have these things built in as part of their life. Now, they're not thinking this is going to make me happy necessarily every day, but just by having that as routine, you greatly increase the chances that you'll have more happy moments in your day. They also find that happy people are luckier than people who are unhappy. And what mm -hmm. they find mm -hmm. is that happy people just weren't you know, born that way. They didn't, weren't born with good luck. They do small things, small interactions every day that create luck for themselves. That might be saying thank you in a, a way that where they make eye contact with somebody. It might be taking the time to really listen to somebody. But they find that this idea of karma can actually work in really predictive ways. And that people who are happy are mindful of these things, and it comes back to them in really positive ways. Another way to say that is kindness, and that that comes back to you. It, it, I get so much from being kind. So the act of giving, I get so much. Mm -hmm. But, did, well, but I just, could I just so add a, uh, did a question on choice, because you know, that, that old adage, life is a journey, not a destination. Mm -hmm. You know, along this path, you have to make many, many choices, and I, and I suspect what you were just saying, Ty, on, on people doing things on a daily basis, they had to make that choice at some point in time. Right. You know, they just didn't get up and say, I'm gonna go you know, be this happy runner or happy you know, uh, swimmer or something. You, know, you, you basically had to make a choice in your life and you had to, you had to sustain that choice. And, that, and that's the whole point with that, with that adage, because to me, it's like if you don't make that choice, you just wander in life. Mm -hmm. And if you wander in life, you know, more, not, more than not, you're gonna be unhappy. Because you're gonna find many times the opposites are gonna occur where you know, you're gonna run into trouble. And that's, and that's one of the things when I look at this whole theory of happiness, and that's why I raised the point, it's like the relative term. And as you said, Julie, you had to understand happiness because you felt the opposite. You know, and, I th and I think those are important distinctions. Yeah, you can't tell the hills without the valleys. Sure. Yeah, otherwise, you're on a plateau. It all feels the same, and it's boring. Yeah. And we're all subject to being bored. I have a, a I actually have a philosophy, uh, you know, a little formula on how to be happy, and it's related to conscious choice. And it's all about low goals. Mm -hmm. Really. Now think about this for a minute. Low expectations easily achieved to reinforce success. You know, hey, my feet hit the floor this morning. Oh, it's a good day. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, you keep your goals low and you feel successful and then you're putting that out and that's what comes back. Isn't that karma? Well, that sounds like gratitude to me, which is, I think is a, yeah. f a f part of the formula. Mm -hmm. Sure, gratitude. It is a good part of it. And I ironically, when I looked at my Twitter feed this morning on CNN and Twitter, there was an article about happiness. Mm -hmm. I, oh, thank you. And, um, and, <laughs> uh, and uh, a, a big uh, a surprising... Um, ingredient is um, compassion, mm -hmm. which makes sense, which is, you know, being able to feel empathy outside of yourself and being able to understand what other people are going through, and it can help make me more happy, and that, that rings true for me, too. A huge piece that comes out, service to others, mm -hmm. that it, it isn't just about you. Uh, it, it, you. You're doing something for other people, and you derive the benefit of their 
pleasure. Very much so, and I find that in my teaching, when I say I have hundreds of children, it's a way to give. It's a way mm -hmm. to feel their successes, but foster them and mentor them and follow them through their careers and set the example and always be there for them. I derive so much pleasure from supporting and giving to my students. Here's a, um, a definition that uh, came from an article, uh, how to find the buried treasures that lead to lasting joy. First off, they say um, that, let me, I wanna quote this exactly and I have it here. Um, that, well, I know what they said, that uh, joy is available to anybody and you can achieve it at any age. And um, uh, their definition is encapsulated by saying, it isn't money or fame or even good health that leads to enduring joy in adulthood. Joy comes from optimism, low goals, the ability to be with others, connectedness, a feeling of being in control of your life, and a can-do attitude coupled with a want-to-do attitude. Anybody want to respond to that? Could you say the last part again? A can-do attitude coupled with a want-to-do attitude. I can do this, mm -hmm. and I want to do it, so I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. You're in control of your life. I think that's part of where they're going with that. Well, clearly, clearly, uh, happiness is not money. You know, I think, I think, you know, the empirical data clearly supports the fact that, you know, people making five five million dollars a year versus people making a hundred thousand dollars a year, there's no difference in happiness. And so, I think if if people, you know, use that sense of of a measurement, and and in one of my earlier panels today, I, I had the pleasure of sitting in front of a, a, you know, half the audience was high school students. And they were asking, you know, what do you do? What should we do to move our career? What should we study? And, and the, really the answer was, do what is passion, is what you were saying mm -hmm. earlier. You know, Follow do what passion. you love, because if you do what you love, you'll be happy, you'll be content with your life, and money will follow. So money should not be one of the objects to seek in, in, in terms of happiness. Well, that was the philosophy I always uh, told my kids, that if you do what you love, uh, eventually, you're going to learn to do it well, and eventually, you know, you'll probably make a living out of it. But you got to stay with it. And I, I've seen examples of that all my life. My godson used to tag subways in, in New York. I mean, you know, graffiti, you know, illegal. And it didn't even stay in school. Now, he is uh, literally a, a world-class designer of his own line of stuff because he always wanted to draw. And uh, that, that passion, uh, that persistence, 10,000 hours, I can't remember, I think it was Gladwell that wrote the book on 10,000 yep. hours. Uh, he became good at it and people paid him for it. So uh, that whole idea of uh, sticking with your passion uh, really makes sense. Mm -hmm. I, I always look to musicians for that because you have such a hard road it's to hold. It's far more than 10,000 hours. Yeah, I know. <laughs> far yeah. more, underestimation. Well, here's My, a, my here, best friend says, um, She's just, my oldest friend in the world says, "You know, your career is a testimony, is a testament as much to your stubbornness as anything." Mm -hmm. And I think that's true because I've just been. I was determined to do this, and I still am, apparently. And um, you know, it's really just about keep on keeping on, um, mm -hmm. which makes me happy. I, I also I want to say that I, I feel like, and this, you'd probably know more about this. Um, there's so many different kinds of happiness, you know, there really are. I mean, you used a couple of terms for them. I didn't know the terms, but, um, you know, you, I mean, you can be happy, uh, you know, you can be happy if you buy your new house or your thing that you, you know, wanted to get there. That's a kind of happiness, you know, and then there's the kind of happiness when you do something altruistic and you do something that you feel has meaning for, for someone else or, or for you or whatever. And, and, um, you know, there are just there are so many different kinds of happiness. I feel like, you know, we, we start, it starts to sound like a self-help book sometimes mm -hmm. when we talk about it, but they're really, it's, it's really worth just looking at what different things make you happy, because maybe, you know, sticking to your art and sticking to your guns about something that you're not making a lot of money does make you happy, but, but boy, when, you know, when you get a new car, it, it makes you happy too, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? But, but I, think, I think the title, when you, when, you, when you throw the word pursuit, 
into the title, right. it kind of changes the connotation of what you're really saying because, because then it makes it like you have to do something. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and and I, I, think, I think that relates about what you're just saying. But, it, but just right. that word. It also pursue. implies that you don't have it because yeah, you have because to you go have out to and pursue it. it. Yeah. Yeah. I like the word cultivate. <laughs> cultivate happiness. Yeah. Here's a question for our musicians. Um, we've heard of the tortured artist. And uh, mm -hmm. so much good music comes out of pain. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question is, how do musicians find happiness when most music is, in a way, very sad? Well, is it? I don't know. Is it? <laughs> I like plenty sad. of it. I is. Like yeah, I love music. it too. Oh yeah. Sad music is a way to for my heart to cry. Mm -hmm. It's a way for my soul to have a sound and an expression. Better to let it out through my horn than keep it in. Mm -hmm. That's a implode. release. It's a beautiful. It's a beautiful opportunity yeah. to express sadness. Mm -hmm. And certainly for me, uh, the music that has, that reaches me, I start weeping. As when something reaches me, I start crying. That's, yeah. that's for sure. Whether I'm, I've cried on stage. I actually played one time um, with Aretha Franklin. And at the sound check, she was, um, she was in a really good mood. And she sang for 45 minutes at the sound check, which that was unusual. And it was the most amazing singing I've ever heard, I've heard in my life probably. It was, mm -hmm. it was just, it, it was drop dead mm -hmm. amazing. And, um, and I was sitting there playing, sobbing while I was playing because it was just so beautiful. So. Mm -hmm. Does money relate to happiness? Mm. Well, that, well, that's right. You know, yeah. I, I feel like you can't say yes or no to that. I mean, it, it doesn't. There, you can be very happy without a lot of money, but you need some money to live. You can't really. Mm -hmm. It's it's if you're worried about how you're going to pay the electric bill, you you know there's there's um there's there's some angst right there. I assure you. you well, know, I, I have I have a theory about that too. I'm not on a panel, but uh, that money to me is the uh, the best example of the law of diminishing returns. And what I mean by that is when you don't have money and you get a little more, there's a lot of bang to it. You know, you get out of college and you get a job, and oh my gosh, I, I have an apartment of my own, I have my own car, you know, I can go out and have dinner, and that's, that's a lot of bang. And you get raises, but as your money goes up, the bang diminishes until ultimately it flattens out, and then it goes the other way. Uh, the, you get a certain amount of money and it becomes a problem. David Geffen had a, a, a great quote. And uh, he said that uh, anyone that thinks money buys happiness has never really made a lot of money. But, uh, but I also well, I th there's a number, right? I, there is a number, actually. Yeah. So yeah. in Colorado, yeah. exactly. Yeah, there's it, a there sweet a spot. Yeah, it would there actually is. be $14 an hour is, is where you cross some line where you don't have to, if you have a family, you don't have to worry now as much about making ends meet at that point. Mm -hmm. Now. Up to about seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars. That's, right. that's, that's where your right. yep. that's where that's it caps right. out, that's and now it's you get this diminishing return. And then when you get up around the two hundred thousand dollar range and beyond, you actually start to see adverse outcomes for kids right. at that point. So kids who come from really wealthy homes are just as likely to end up with uh, mood disorders, uh, anxiety disorders, and substance abuse disorders as kids who come from homes below the poverty line which is kind of a fascinating idea that, that that can happen. I think the other thing you see is in cross-cultural data, when you compare countries, um, there, there's a line there. And so as long as you're able to meet your basic needs, you know, then you can, you can be pretty happy. And there's a lot of countries that make a lot less money than we do here in the United States. They're a lot happier than we are. But, but it, it, it's also a point of how much you have to sacrifice to, to, to make that money. I think, you know, it's, it's not just... The, the number itself, because you know, if you're if you're an executive, one of the sessions, like, you know, what keeps us up at night was a question asked. You know, I mean, there's a lot of executives who would, would be gladly think rethink their lives, and I and I and I, and I raised a question earlier about this whole point about work, I, and, I, and I asked the question. I said, when you're in your deathbed, you know, you're not going to be sitting there asking yourself, I wish I worked longer in life. You know, you're, you're going to want to sit back and say, you know, how is the quality of my life? And, and it's, not, it, it's not purely money. And I, and I think you're right. So you're saying 70, you know, 80,000, et cetera. I mean, you can see that. And, you know, people are not happy because there's so much more pressure. There's so much more responsibilities that you have to take on 
that you start saying to yourself, is, is it really worth it, the, the, the trouble and hassle? I don't know if we have an answer for this, but it's a very interesting question. Uh, is there any research uh, with regard to happiness and Down syndrome? Uh, this comes from uh, a nurse uh, uh, who notes that all of her Down syndrome patients seem to be chronically happy. Hmm. There must be data on that. I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't know it, but... Um, good question. Yeah, that's Very a good, good question. question. There, there have been a couple of questions related to good health and happiness and um, uh, uh, drugs, uh, I, I mean, you know, pres prescript, uh, prescription drugs. Pursuit of drugs. Uh, brain <laughs> chemistry, <laughs> yeah, right, brain chemistry. Uh, anybody want to comment on that and how, I mean, we, we know there are lots of folks with ADD and, uh, you know, you hear a lot of talk about uh, brain chemistry and adjusting brain chemistry. Uh, well, uh, medication can't, can't make you happy, it can make you less unhappy. Hmm. It is what that can do. So it can take you from negative seven to let's say negative two or zero, which trust me is, is an important thing to do. Um, but it's, it's not never gonna take you from zero to positive five or positive seven. So that's, that's the limitation of it. Uh, uh, Ty, in your research of happiness, uh, what was the most surprising thing you uncovered or found about it? Anything? Uh, I'll, I'll tell you what had the most impact on me that mm -hmm. I adopted for my personal life maybe. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the thing that fascinated me was the ordinary magic of happiness. And what I mean by that is that the term I you hear people say anecdotally the most, I think, that I know they're the happiest people, is they like to use the term, I love to do the work. And, and you know, that, that goes back to this point of your happiness is not coming from external kinds of validation or factors. You, you just love what you do, right? Have you ever, I hope you've had something like that where you just loved it so much that just simply having the opportunity to spend two or three hours doing it made you happy. Or you have friends who don't have to do anything spectacular. You know, they don't have to bring you big balloons or you know, fancy dinners or anything else. You just could sit there outside here at the UMC and talk for two hours and you just simply enjoy their presence. Um, I, I think that's had the biggest impact on me is just how ordinary happiness is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, is it a, um, a steady state of feeling or is it uh, something that varies based on the situation? Happiness, is it uh, it's a general or is it related to what happens to you? I think that's the core of the question. I would agree with the comment that Claire made earlier. If, if I see people walking around constantly happy, I think there's a problem somewhere <laughs> going on. And I, and I might be turning the opposite away. Tick tock, tick tock. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it has to be a state of up and down. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I just can't see somebody constantly, you know, happy unless they had a really bad plastic surgeon job and. <laughs> and they have a constant smile on their face. <laughs> but I, also but I heard that makes you feel good about yourself because you did something to look better. <laughs> I think it's also a wake-up call. Mm -hmm. So if you're finding yourself at a low moment and it doesn't feel good, what are the tools that you have to cultivate your own happiness? Mm -hmm. What's, what are your options? There's a lot of good options out there. Well, it's high. there's a lot of questions coming up here for you. Um, and uh, but I'll, I'll just throw them at you. Have you noticed differences in gender, race, class when it comes to happiness? Yes. Uh, let's take gender. That's, that's, a, that's an interesting one. So um, women are a little bit happier than men. Women do better than men in general, I should say. Uh, just kind of across the board. Uh, now, but it's, it's complicated. So women do better for a number of reasons. One of the reasons is they don't do as many dumb things. Um, <laughs> The, the second reason is that the relationships tend to be, have more depth, so they tend to have more intimacy. This is a big deal right now. The size of our social networks has not changed. Um, that's remained steady across the past few decades, but what has changed is that the majority of people now in the United States say that they have nobody to talk to about a serious problem that they have, which is a big reversal from what we saw just two or three decades wow. ago. So yeah. women are more likely to be able to have those conversations on, on average, and that contributes as well. But th there's also some things where there's some struggle as well. Some of the most fascinating data recently I've seen is that just having to live with daily sexism 
is exhausting. And one of the things you'll find is that women actually are just more tired at the end of the day. And if you look at, if you correlate that with the number of sexist incidents that they had to tolerate during the course of the day, it's a pretty strong relationship. So although women are happier on average, right, there's a little bit of struggle involved with that and a little bit of work involved with that um, that, can be, that can be taxing. Uh, do you suppose it's because women are generally better communicators? Yes, they're better. I mean, <laughs> I'm going to be hard-pressed to say what they're not better at, actually. Yeah. And I'm not joking about that. It's, uh, it's unbelievable across the board uh, how much they maintain an advantage with psychological characteristics and interpersonal characteristics. Um, but, you know, maybe I'll do one more. Race, uh, race you do see differences. And once again, it's, it's contextual. So um, African-Americans, for example, show slightly lower rates of happiness compared to Caucasian Americans. But if you look at the variables that mediate that, mm. it's because of the racism or the conditions, uh, the living conditions or whatever else that they might have to deal with in a given day that explains that relationship. So it's not race that's explaining it. It's the conditions that are associated with race that explain it. Mm -hmm. Here's two questions. I'm going to combine them. Um, do you think that social media has an effect on happiness? And the other question is, do you believe that our current culture society creates more anxiety and depression? So is it harder to be happy today? I mean, is, is uh, you know, the onslaught of communications uh, making us less happy? I mean, I, I start to answer. I mean, I, I think today, you know, we're, we're clearly overloaded with choices. And, you know, and that creates angst in itself. I mean, I think when people are, you know, looking at what they can buy, what they can watch, what they can wear, you know, people struggle, is my hair correct, and my shoes right, et cetera, you know, that, that creates a problem. I mean, I, I, I don't know, I, I was just thinking that, just before you asked that question, I was just thinking the same thing in my mind. I was gonna ask the panel, what do we think of social media and does it really, mm -hmm. does it really add to happiness? And, and, and I imagine the communication, the, you know, the connectedness mm -hmm. part is great, mm -hmm. but does it also put pressure on people to have to do things and, and communicate when they really don't want? Is there, you know, is there happiness in privacy? You know, I, I, I again, to go back to the session earlier, you know, I, I was advising some of the high school kids, uh, you know, be careful if you wanna look at, you know, what you're gonna do in terms of reputational damage, you know, which will come back, or cyberbullying, which we now see is, is, is a major problem in, in, in a lot of the high school age students, you know, you gotta be careful what you put on social media. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I'm not sure if it aids or detracts from it, but it clearly you have to be a little more responsible in social media. I, I would say um, that I, f I feel like this thing is, has become, I'm like a monkey with a morphine button. I'm just like, uh, uh, one more, uh, I wonder, did anybody text me in the last four seconds? And, and it, it's, it, there, but there is uh, a, a real, there, there is like a sense of connectedness. Uh, there is some idea that I'm connected to people or I'm, you know, there, I don't know, it's a weird, it's a weird dichotomy because I think, you know, in a way we are all more um, connected because of these things. And, and in another way, the, uh, the personal, I, I find people are a lot um, less inclined. Like, I, I kind of miss the telephone. I kind of miss talking to people. Like, most people don't want to talk on the phone anymore. Mm -hmm. It's text me. Just text me. Mm -hmm. You know, so I'm sure, I'm sure there, I'm sure there are uh, different answers on that one. I like social media. I'm very careful with what I put out there. It's usually something business related or I'm playing a concert or I'm in Colorado at this conference or we had a concert two nights ago or pictures of the whole orchestra that I was playing with. Those are the things I'll put out there, but it keeps me very connected to a really large community, mostly French horn players around the world. And that, I find that a lot of fun. Uh, it, there's, uh, there, there's a couple of questions up here that uh, uh, they go to genetics. Are you born happy? Are some folks more predisposed to be happy than others? And can you uh, account for that or overcome it? I believe I wasn't born happy. I believe I've cultivated it. Mm -hmm. And I know my parents. 
So mm -hmm. I know where I come from, I know where they come from. Eastern European Jews who are persecuted. This is not a happy bunch, mm -hmm. <laughs> seriously. Or growing up in the depression, um, working so hard and having no money, they struggled really, really mightily. Mm -hmm. But it gave me a certain fortitude. There's a Yiddish word, koyach. Does anyone know koyach in this room? It's a type of strength where it just, it gives you drive to push through and better yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's a beautiful thing to have. But, you know, and there, there's, yes, evidence to support that some people are just born happier than others. They kind of luck out in the genetic lottery. Um, and that can be great, because if you are born happy, you'll just be happy. You know, you probably know friends like that. You're like, wow, <laughs> no matter what, you're just happy, aren't you? And uh, <laughs> there's some of us that just have a hard time doing that, a little more Eeyore-like, maybe. But, um, it, but it is malleable. You know, if you think that there's a bell curve of, of happiness in the general population, and you think about where you land, so let's say you're a 6 out of 10, well, you have your own bell curve, right? You have some days that are happier than others. You have some years that are better, better than others. And what you figure out, I think, is you get older and you learn from life and get some wisdom is what are the things, right, that, that I can do to, to make me happy and make it sustainable? And I think that's the lesson that's a little hard to learn sometimes. But you, but you always hear that, that, that comment, is it, you know, and everybody's gotten this question asked to them in their lives, you know, is the glass half empty or half full? You know, and, and, that's, and that's sort of, a, you know, when you talk about, you know, are you, are you happy, you know, are you through genetics or birth? You know, I, I think the real answer to that question, from my perspective, and, you know, it's, again, from my, my own perspective and view of life, is it all depends on where it started. You know, if, if the glass was pretty low and it's half full, it's pretty good. You know, if it was full and now it's half, well, maybe that's a different part of life, you know, and it, but I, so I, I just think that it depends on where you start. So I'm not, mm -hmm. you know, maybe the data and the research shows that, but I, it's, kind of, it's kind of like cultivated a little bit. I don't, I, don't, I don't think it's something that you can really say that you're born with. You know, I see a lot of babies that are smiling all the time. Does that mean, you know, they're happy and others are crying? Maybe, maybe some have rashes and the others don't. Mm -hmm. But, but is there a chemical, is there a chemical c component here? I mean, because that's what I meant in the beginning when I said I feel like I have a capacity to be very happy, and I, and you know, and I feel like I, like I feel like I have a capa the, right. the capacity to be happy. Yeah, the, actually, the, the research has, has advanced to the point now. So genetics, right? Genes just say this is how your brain's going to be structured, and then you can do brain imaging. You can actually see differences in brain structure, and then you can see yeah. differences in neurotransmitter release or, or reuptake uh, with dopamine or something like that. So there's this really nice pattern where you're like, okay, so there's some heritability, there's some structural differences, and now there's functional differences and how people respond to certain situations. But uh, I would agree that it, it can certainly be cultivated. And, and people yeah. can certainly get better. And as people get older, people tend to get happier on average. Mm -hmm. And there's the neuroplasticity of the brain where you do certain practices, Absolutely. you're guaranteed mm -hmm. oh, to yeah. get happier. Yeah. And that's what I ascribe to. Yeah, but it, it, for the research, though, that, have you had enough study, long, you know, latitudinal, longitudinal studies, to be able to confirm over time that somebody who is supposedly genetically disposed of being happiness over their life are happy. Yeah, it's, uh, there are pretty good studies, so about as good as you can get because you can't randomly assign people to a gene genetic condition, uh, ethically, I guess. Uh, but yeah, short of that, it's, it's pretty compelling, but it's important to say that there's still 40, 45 percent malleability, which mm -hmm. is a lot uh, yeah. built into there. And the other thing I guess I should mention is that we're only talking about happiness. There's a lot of other good things in different, you know, in fact, happiness is a very U.S. kind of phenomenon. A lot of other cultures will talk about contentment as the greatest emotion to strive for, the greatest state to strive for. It's a very different kind of thing. Or you could be loving, you know, or you could be curious. There, there's all kinds of great things people can have besides happiness, actually, that are worth aspiring to or that they might, you know, uh, be born with, with a little bit of predisposition for that. Here's a Wait. good... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. When you when you do the um, the things that you cultivate to cultivate the happiness, is that changing the chemistry of your brain? Yes. Is that is that how you do that? Yes. Absolutely. All right. Well, there it is. Repetition. <laughs> yeah. No. Like mm -hmm. a rat going through a maze. <laughs> right. But it changes. It's changing chemically. It's changing. Absol right. Absolutely. So oh. if I start training for uh, to run the one mile faster than I do now, it's not fast. 
uh, I would improve, <laughs> right? And my body would actually change to accommodate the different conditions it's under. And it's, it's much the same analogy for how happiness would work with your neuroplasticity. So what you're saying is that uh, happiness is a conscious choice and you can practice yourself into it. Right. But I'll, like, I'll never run a four minute mile, you know, so yeah, right. uh, th there's limitations to it, but you can, you can move yourself quite a ways. But you can be content running a two minute, a six minute mile. <laughs> <laughs> I would be very happy to run a six minute mile right now. So, yeah. All right, let's talk about drugs. Um, Dopamine. Do, uh, yeah, well, that's it. Uh, it, it. You don't do drugs. I mean, this is a state where we legalized marijuana and it appears to make a lot of people happy. Uh, and, uh, but uh, other types of drugs, uh, what is the effect of drugs uh, on happiness? And uh, the question also was about depression, but I believe that's more of a chemical solution, usually depression, is that accurate? Yeah, you know, depression would be something where you're negative five, you wanna get to zero. So you get yeah. a SSRI, like a Prozac or something like that, and that improves your, you know, condition a bit. Sometimes yeah. placebos will improve your condition in uh, quite a bit. But there are drugs you can take, certainly, that will make you happier, right? And uh, will make you super happy, some of them. But uh, the, the question, I guess, is what's your, what's your standard for happiness? So is it a 30-minute burst? Uh, if that's the case, then yes, yeah, definitely. Uh, if it's, will that make me happier across time? I'm not too sure about that. Uh, most, of, most of the time, I think the answer is no, although one exception right now that's coming back into vogue a little bit this data is not conclusive, so don't run with this, but uh, they've been tinkering with LSD again mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. seeing if that can get people out of a rut sometimes. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's experimental. So yeah. don't go well, out, kids. I'm, and I'm not going to say that I did ecstasy in the 1970s, but if I did, <laughs> there might have been a moment, there might have been like ec ecstatic, you know, moments and stuff and, you know, hallucinogenics and stuff that's mind altering into other dimensions, you know, which, which there are. And, um, but I think when you use the general term of drugs, um, a lot of times people are using drugs to escape something in their life and that mm -hmm. catches up. Mm -hmm. I think that catches up eventually. Um, yeah. yeah, they're choosing to alter their reality for some reason, something about their reality they don't like. Right. But can't you, can't you not, um, release the same type of dopamine by exercise. It doesn't. It doesn't have to be com completely through <laughs> through through drugs. I'm sorry, Claire. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, that one. I mean, I, 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 you know, when you're running, for example, you know, you, you feel happy when you're done. I'm kidding. I mean, so you know, it, you don't you don't always need drugs. It's like banging your head against the wall. I feel happy when I stop. That's true. Yeah. true. Many levels of happiness. All right. Uh, here's a good question. Uh, we know that news is bad news by definition. You know, uh, they don't lead off with, hey, uh, you know, you woke up this morning, you had a good day, and went to bed. You know, they're going to talk about bad news. So does constant exposure to news mm. make someone unhappy? Or, or, or uh, and conversely to that, would it be helpful if there was a break for news, like you said, okay, I'm not going to listen to the news for a week or a month or something like that? Anybody? I choose not to watch the news. Yeah. Uh, Can't uh, help but notice a few things, but <laughs> <laughs> I choose not to pay attention because it's all bad. Yeah. Yeah. It is. Well, I, I think the question is actually a really good question because because you don't news is not there is no there is nothing positive on the news. I mean, every time you turn on the television to whatever station you you watch the news, it's always negative. Yeah. And and and, and a. And a and a constant stream of that, you're going to be depressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, know, you think the it world is. is falling apart. Yep. I mean, if I if I look out today, and you know, working in Moscow right now, and I follow the, the stream of dialogue that's going on in the U.S. press today, you know, I should be depressed that I'm going back and forth to Russia all the time mm -hmm. with this sort of neg negativity. But when I'm actually in Moscow, you don't sense the same type of, you know, negativity or or, or you know animosity towards, say, Americans, mm -hmm. you know, maybe on some of the state ch channels you get it, but I, but I think a constant stream of news will clearly make you depressed. Do you think the Russian people are happier than the American people? Um, I, I, don't, I don't know if there's a, a degree of, you know, one's more happier than another, but I can give you kind of an example. 
you know, I, I run a lot. I mean, because with the travel, I want to do something as kind of a stress release, so I, I run. And every time I'm running, whether it's here in Boulder or Florida, New York, or wherever I travel, London, everybody who passes me, I always smile and wave, wave to them, you know, and say hello. I do that in Moscow, and I get the strangest looks. And, 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 and I, actually, I actually count it. I actually count it that, you know, for every 10 people I run by, you know, if I get one person who acknowledges me back mm -hmm. with a smile and a wave, I did pretty good. But I don't know if that's, if that's uh, a measure of whether or not they're happier or not. Um, I, think, I, think, I think in general they're happy people. Well, you're putting out good vibes. And I'm putting out good vibes. I try. Karma. Yeah. Hey, Ty, uh, in your study of happiness, did you learn how to be more happy? Uh, <laughs> you know, f first I should say that uh, I, it's, it's not like my original studies I'm, I'm citing here. These would be other people's studies that I read a lot. So, um, it, you know, this is other data that's out there, but there's a lot of it now. And, um, you know, people oftentimes ask that about psychologists in general. They're like, you, you know, has this made you happier, better at certain things? And um, I don't know that the action has been on happiness. I think that the action has been on gratitude. Uh, because I think uh, in psychology, you just you, you get to see a broad range of what people are dealing with. And you get to feel fortunate about what you have and the opportunities you have. Uh, so I, I think that's probably been the biggest effect. And I think that leads to some kind of contentment, maybe some eudaimonic kind of uh, happiness. But um, I, I think that's probably been the best part. But can, can, you, can you relate this or correlate this to, say, the news? I mean, you know, you're sitting there and you said before, it was, if it wasn't until Martin Sutherman came up with the positive optimism, mm -hmm. everything was negative, right? So, I mean, I, I would think, you know, if, if I was a, a psychiatrist or something, I mean, a constant stream of negativity, just like a constant stream of negativity on the news, you have to be negative. I mean, you have to be depressed. It has to affect you personally. I mean, how do you remove yourself from hearing these stories time and time again, trying to help people that have that have problems. Yeah, in their lives. you become an author instead of a psychologist. Uh, it's, <laughs> you know, one, one thing that happens. They, th there's certain people though that can, you know, they they're just great at it, a and they just have this endless stream of empathy. I, it's unbelievable. <clears throat> My mother's this way. My mother uh, is a, a therapist, and she'll you know she'll see eight people a day, and she's mm. golden at the end of the day. Uh, she's even stronger. Something you know, like. I would be crushed at this point, you know, and I think it's such important work and such good work to do. But I, you know, when I, when I was doing it in school, I could see maybe two or three people and then I, I had exhausted what I could give at, at that point. So, um, you know, I, th I think it's important to choose environments that work for you and, you know, people can tell you what works for them and that's great and sometimes I borrow from people. Uh, but ultimately you gotta figure out what's, what's your thing that works well for you. You know, I had a friend, Amy, she said, Ty, you're happiest when you don't know what the hell you're doing. I said, well, that's a weird thing to say, you know, but um, it turned out to be true. You know, I, I, like, I like investigating. I, I, when I was a kid, I didn't think that would be what I'd love to do as an adult. But, you know, so everyone has something different, and you just got to find what it is for you. That's a good question. To be happy, should you drop the word should? In other words, does everyone have to be happy? I guess. No, <laughs> some people are really happy being unhappy. <laughs> I'm not even kidding, really. Well, uh, that kind of dovetails into uh, love and happiness. And uh, we all know when you're in love, uh, you feel happier. And uh, the CWA is all about young folks. And so I have this article that was uh, written for young folks, uh, Advice for a Happy Life. Got this out of the Wall Street Journal. And uh, it says the transition from college to adult life is treacherous. And so there's five points that they recommend. Number one, consider marrying young. I mean, I think all the research comes out that married people are generally happier than, than unmarried. True, Ty? That's true. Yeah. But it's complicated. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, it's that connectedness and that, that uh, someone to share life with. Uh, he goes on to say, if you wait until your 30s, your marriage is likely to be a merger. If you get married in your 20s, it's likely to be a startup. You will both have memories of your life together. Uh, you will have a shared experience. 
that was his recommendation, consider marrying early. Second point is learn how to recognize your soulmate. Marry someone with similar tastes and preferences, but if you dislike each other's friends or don't get, in, uh, get each other's senses of humor, or especially if you have different ethical impulses, break it off and find someone else. So uh, marriage, uh, is that uh, been a positive uh, in your life? That, but a dangerous question, right? How much time do we have? Yeah, right. <laughs> Anybody else want to say? Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm divorced. I'm happily divorced. Me too. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I've seen those statistics too. I think we just make up whatever we want about life anyway. So I don't know. I'm, I'm, I am single. I've been, I mean, I, I was married and um, I was in a long relationship after that. And I'm, I am. I will say I'm happily single at this time and, and I appreciate my autonomy. And when I hear that, uh, I, 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 obviously I bristle when I hear you know, that married people are happier. I'm like, really, really? Like, but uh, maybe, maybe it is true, but I know that I'm, I'm, uh, I've uh, cultivated an acceptance of my life and where it's at now and I'm, you know, I'm good with that. So I'm not, I'm not the, the one to answer that question. Well, he, right he supports that. Yeah. He says it's absolutely crucial that you really, really like your spouse. But uh, you know, the, the <laughs> uh, well, that's true. But the opposite of that, you know, are, are they? Is he promoting that a hookup society is no. is is a way to go? No, 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 no. He, he's no. talking about long-term relationships. Okay. So, cause, cause, mm -hmm. yeah, right. so when you look at over yeah. time, I, I mean, I don't know how the statistics will bear themselves out because if you look at the stigma of divorce, you know, p you know, your parents in the 40s and 50s, et cetera. You know, they were living together. You know, in maybe today's society, they would they would have divorced much quicker, but they stuck together. You know, and I, I'm not sure how the how the statistics will bear that out to be able to make that assessment on whether or not long-term relationships are happy. I mean, you know, I, I find that you know finding the person that I want to be with and doing things together. You know, it doesn't mean we're always going to be happy. It doesn't mean we're always going to do the same thing. I mean, we're individuals. I think mm -hmm. that's the whole thing, you know, we're yeah. individuals. And I think it's invariably that, you know, I want somebody who has similar interests, you know, but I also have my own interests that may not correlate or correspond to, to a person. And, uh, you know, I, so I think, I think it sounds to me, when, I, when I'm listening to you read that article, it almost sounds uh, like a formula. Right. You know, mm -hmm. and, it, and it doesn't feel real. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, mm -hmm. it, that's what I was thinking too. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, <clears throat> the, um, um, uh, his third point is eventually stop fretting about fame and fortune. You arrive at age 40, you enjoy your work, you found your soulmate, you're raising a couple of terrific kids and recognize that you will probably never, never become either rich or famous. At that point, it is important to supplant your youthful ambition with mature understanding and acceptance. <laughs> no. Yeah. Yeah. Now, what, what is what seriously you annoying? Just me. I will say I made my first record of, as a leader at forty. So yeah. that's that one didn't that one really didn't work for me. That one made me unhappy to hear. Uh, <laughs> so uh, you're interpreting that as uh, like you know give up your ambition at forty yeah, or something. Yeah, or I mean, but that's the whole thing. You know, and I don't like the whole formulated, you have this, you have the kids, you have the, the this, you have that, you have this, and then you decide that you're going to be okay from now on. Like, I don't know, it just didn't ring real mm -hmm. to me at all. Okay. But that's just me. Anybody else? I agree. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I think it's important to, to point out, too, that happy, happier people are, married people are happier on average, but that's largely because they were happier before they got married. So the happiest mm -hmm. people are actually more likely to get married, and that drives ah. up the average, okay? Ah. Because, okay. and it's just the tail end. If you're not super happy, don't worry. But if, if, if you're super un unhappy, then do worry, because that's not attractive, you know? Like, if you're just, like, a real down-to-dumps person all the time, that, that's unattractive. And um, <laughs> so, so you probably want to move that up a little bit. But happy people, you know, yeah, that's, that's romantically attractive. Mm -hmm. Well, here, here's, uh, here's his next point. Uh, watch Groundhog Day repeatedly. You know the movie Groundhog Day? <laughs> All right, and, and he says, it, for those that are not familiar with it, uh, uh, the, he has to relive the same day over and over and over until he gets it right. Mm -hmm. 
And the movie shows the bumpy, unplanned evolution of Bill Murray uh, from pro, uh, uh, of his protagonist, which is Bill Murray, from a jerk to a fully realized human being, a person who has learned to experience deep, lasting, and justified satisfaction with life, even though he has only one day to work with. So that's living in the now, isn't it? Yeah, I, you know, that movie, that movie to me brings back you know, the memories of my time in, in the city you were talking about, Norilsk, because I was there for six months, and every day I would wake up, it would be the same, minus 45 degrees, minus 50 degrees, three, three, wow. months, of, three months of darkness, you know, depression around, you know, it, it, it reminded me every day, that's what, that's, what we, that's what we used to joke about. It was Groundhog Day mm -hmm. every day, so I guess the end result is either I am a happy person because I survived, mm -hmm. you know, and I still am staying in Russia. So I, I, I guess I was able, strong enough as a person to be able to handle that type of depression, but that was a perfect example mm -hmm. in my life of relating to the Groundhog Day movie. Mm -hmm. His last point is take religion seriously. And speaking to college students, he says, uh, you know, they believe smart people don't believe in that stuff anymore. Uh, you followed the religion of your parents as children, but left religion behind as you were socialized by college. And he suggests uh, that the good way to find religion is to read about contemporary cosmology. The universe isn't only stranger than we knew, it is stranger and vastly more unlikely than we could have imagined. Um, uh, I mean, if you've ever tried to contemplate infinity, you know, I mean, it, it gets real squirrely. Was this very all quickly. in the Wall? Is this from the Wall Street Journal? It was an article in the Wall Street Journal. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. It was uh, the Saturday What's essay. To the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, it, but uh, it, that brings up the idea of meditation. And oh. uh, how about meditation? Love it. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. There's one particular kind I appreciate. It's called meta meditation. Does anyone here? know about metta meditation? It's called loving kindness and it's all about your heart. And for me that brings so much joy and satisfaction and connection to people that you love. Mm -hmm. I also support meditation. Is there anything in, well I know there's a lot of research on meditation. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's amazing. I mean yeah. it's, it's amazing to get some of the, uh, some of the monks from uh, East Asia, and they bring them into the University of Wisconsin, and they put them in a really stressful situation, and they say, now chill out, and it is instantaneous. You know, all of this meditation over the course of years, they can just sh just shut it down and look totally relaxed. Um, and so that, that habit, that practice, uh, can, can really be built up to something powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, with some very uh, strong physiological effects, you know, calmness and, and so forth. Um, the, uh, I think I already asked that question. Uh, how do you avoid early onset grumpiness? <laughs> yeah, but maybe just don't take yourself so seriously. Jesus. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's a great question, you know, mm -hmm. because, uh, it can happen, certainly, and I, I think, I heard some good advice from a comedian, they said, yeah, once you start saying, uh, you know, kids these days, or this newfangled, this and that, and once you hear yourself saying those phrases, you should get concerned about yourself, and, uh, and I think that's true, because I have some friends now, and I'm like, wow, you're getting really curmudgeonly, and you're not really fun to hang out with anymore, you know? Um, yeah, just always. It, it happened, you can see it across generations, right? You can see across generations that eventually people start to say, kids these days, you know? And, um, I, I love coming to things like this, because I just, last night at dinner, I had three different people set me straight about three different ideas that I was totally wrong about. You know, all of them um, undergraduate students here. And I, I think the great thing for the students in the room, if you're an undergraduate or, uh, you know, student here, is that there's few times in your life where you're, you'll be so open-minded and so well-versed in so many different ways of thought. Uh, I think it's one of the, the, the best times in life. And, uh, you know, 
as you get older, you want to keep contact with that. You want to keep that eager, open mentality because uh, society and culture will conspire against you to, to make you appreciate those things less. And, and, and I, I would add to, to this, what I said earlier. I mean, that, this is to me the point of being the opposite or a relative term. I mean, you know, if you're grumpy or you know grumpy people, you would only know happiness until after you were grumpy. You, you know, you can't sit there all the time and be happy. You have to understand what the opposite side is. So I, I, I just think it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fact of life that you're gonna run across people that, you know, what, what he says grumpy or you say grumpy, you know, or sad people, but you're not gonna know happiness until you experience that other element of life. Um, I do my best to not surround myself with grumpy people, but to surround mm -hmm. myself with conscious, happy, loving people that I can connect with. I make those choices consciously. It could be part of your choice to be happy. Yeah, absolutely. It it works. Works. Mm -hmm. Here's a question. Uh, does uh, diversity, or perhaps overstimulation, does diversity cause overstimulation and decrease happiness? That might be a social media uh, issue. What, what sort of diversity? Well, I'm not sure. Just as diversity. I, I, would, I would assume it's just uh, stimulation that the, uh, you know, we're all assaulted by uh, communication messages, 2,000 on average a day. Mm. I, I would say it just depends. It depends what you're being assaulted with. If you're, if, if, if you're getting um, a lot of input from things that are exciting to you, it's gonna be great. And if you're getting, you know, political news that you feel like you're being, you, you know, bombarded mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. W with, uh, it might not make you feel so great or, you know, it's, it's, just depends, I'd say, to that one. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I always think like diversity, yeah, that's a valuable thing by itself, but that's, that's, that's never enough, right? Um, you have to do something with it, and, and you have to set a context where it can be meaningful and, and not overwhelming, and that's really, really hard to do. And, uh, you know, so many good ideas come from diversity, and uh, so many good things in life come from diversity, but, uh, Figuring out how to use that in a way and, and manage that in a way that's productive, I think that's, I think that's terribly hard to figure out. Is uh, the definition, the concept of happiness, in the eyes of the beholder? Well, could you say that again? That sounded right. Is the feeling or the concept of happiness in the eyes of the beholder? Absolutely. I would say yes. Absolutely. <laughs> how, how can somebody judge whether you're happy or not. I mean, you can outwardly mm -hmm. fake it, but I think it, yeah, I think it has to be mm -hmm. yourself. There's a couple of questions up here related to money, um, and uh, uh, it, it, you know, I think you already answered it, how much money should you be happy with, or you could achieve happiness with 75,000. The understanding being that, you know, if, you're, if you need food, clothing, and shelter, you can't think right. about happiness. Right. You know, you can't think about anything but that. Uh, and you have to get over that subsistent level of living before you know you could become discretionary in your thinking. So uh, let's see if I can find one more here. But we had a lot on drugs. You know, we wanted to know what drugs would do. You know. Well, maybe some of you would like to tell us what yeah. makes you happy. Yeah, raise your hand if you got a question. You, sir. Yeah, I'll repeat your question. Uh huh. George Burns said the key to happiness is good health and a bad memory. Yeah. Our parents our, was it ruin? Our parents ruined the first half of our lives, and our kids ruined the second half. <laughs> oh. <laughs> It's almost like it's a never-ending cycle, it sounds like. You know, you, you, because you're never gonna be satisfied at that point, and if you're never satisfied because you're always striving for something in addition, you know, can you ever be truly happy? Yeah. 
I've got one from Robert Frost. Happiness makes up in height what it lacks in length. Hmm. Hmm. Very interesting. Uh, yes. At, at all stages of life, it's important to keep expanding uh, your consciousness, keep, uh, uh, you know, increasing your horizons. But don't, right? don't, don't underestimate yourself, because you were very happy last night dancing on that aisles. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was you dancing <laughs> that was last it, night? Yeah. Oh, bravo. Yeah. Very nice. <laughs> okay, here we go with some uh, diversity uh, question. Are homogeneous societies happier than diverse societies. Ooh. I mean, that goes after multiculturalism or something, doesn't it? Are homogeneous societies happier than diverse societies? Well, let's see, what would be the most homogeneous society you could think of? Iceland? Yeah, I was thinking Scandinavian, and, uh, but they are, you know, attempting diversity, right, with all of the immigrants they're bringing in. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I know that I know there's research on, on this topic. I'm I'm not aware of what the findings mm -hmm. are on it, but uh, it's a you know, you know it's a good question. So some of the happiest countries are Scandinavian, actually, but it's confounded with wealth, because uh, mm -hmm. and also of healthcare and all kinds of other things yeah. that that could could yeah. stabilize happiness and vacations. Yeah. Built-in vacations. Yeah, that, that's right. That's yeah. right. But there's also some countries that are very homogeneous that are extraordinarily unhappy, uh, as well. So mm -hmm. um, I. I, I wish I knew off the top of my head, but I can't think. Yeah. I, I, I thought I, Denmark had the highest suicide rate or something, and they related it to the darkness or something. Yeah. I mean, I, I would relate it to the question of diversity. Is anybody who had a chance to watch the concert last night, I said this earlier today, is look at the musicians. I mean, from last night's performance, I mean, they came from Santo Domingo, Brazil, Syria, Lebanon, you know, Lebanon New York. Toronto, Dominican Republic. Uh, yeah, yeah. And so mm -hmm. it was. It was. A, it was a diverse group of people, and it, and it worked. Well, I mean, you were able to make music, and make I'm, people happy. I'm happy. One of the one of the things I love living in New York is the multicultural aspect of it. I don't know that. I don't know if that means it would make mm -hmm. anybody else happy. Mm -hmm. It would probably make somebody else uncomfortable. But I, sure. that's, I, I feel like I need that in my life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I, again, it's all different. We just make this up as we go along. Mm -hmm. One of the best definitions I've heard is happiness is wanting what you have. Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Find a way. Appreciating what you have. Yeah, gratitude. That's gratitude. Yeah. Okay, we'll take one more question if it's out there. All right. Uh, with well, yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were raising your hand. Mm -hmm. Yes. You wake up every morning uh, wondering what should, should you be doing? How does that relate to happiness? Probably makes oh. you very unhappy. I would imagine that would make you very unhappy. Well, the words you choose are extremely potent. What if you were to change the word should to what can? Mm -hmm. What would I like to do? Or, or you just, can't do. Th you could try. Or, or just walk around, <laughs> walk, walk around the university and look what they did on their brand. And be happy, be bolder, be audacious, you know, et cetera. I mean, uh, you know, th I agree. It's it's a word. It's a it's just changing the the, the word. I mean, uh, and I think I think when I walk around and I see these these uh, these statements, I, it, it inspires me. I give you permission. Yes. <laughs> yes. There you go. All right. Permission granted. Yes. You are absolved, my daughter. All right. Yes. Did, is your question about grandkids that I hear? No. About contentedness and happiness, the oh, differentiation. Contentedness and happiness. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, you could actually see how they function differently psychologically, but I think philosophically that's actually the more interesting way to think about it. Uh, 
because happiness, there is this striving, there is this should, I think, sometimes with happiness, where we, we think we got to get somewhere, right? And I think contentment's more about, this is my situation, and for most of us, there's usually a lot of good things going on. We're, we're lucky in that way, right? And, and so just be uh, grateful and to be mindful of the goodness that we already have in our lives, th that's, that's such a different philosophy. I think, and if you look at a lot of the great philosophers across time and across culture, it's much more often about contentment than it is happiness. We are happiness crazy in the U.S., and I think we could use a little more balance. You know? I, I, I just I wrote down before before I came here. I just wrote down a couple things, and I and I and I said, you know, what is that path to happiness? It says, complain less, appreciate more, talk less, listen more, think less feel more, frown less, smile more, fear less, love more. That's excellent advice, and we are unfortunately out of time, and they have to use this room, so we have to end it. Thank I want to thank, thank my you. guests. Thank you, Mark, Claire, Julie, Ty. Hopefully we've been able to give you a couple of ideas about your pursuit of happiness. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.